Okay, so um, yeah, thanks again for inviting me. Uh, it's really glad, to, I'm really glad to be here. Um, my name is Rami. I'm a PhD candidate, uh, fourth year PhD candidate at uh, USF, South Florida. And uh, my advisor is uh, uh, Sudeep Sarkar. Uh, we've both been very inspired by uh, the work here at Menta, and uh, this is why I wanted to share this uh, work. Uh, this is work uh, I collaborated with my uh, other PhD candidates here, uh, Sajab. So um, the title of the paper is Streamer, Streaming Representation Learning and Event Segmentation in a Hierarchical Manner. So the first key word here is streaming. And uh, what we're really hoping to do here is, uh, or what we've uh, achieved in some sense is we have a very long video, um, or, or we can have infinite length video. Hey, hey, Rami, uh, Rami, quick thing. Um, it's your voice is a little bit soft and hard to hear. I don't know if you can speak louder if it's a microphone issue or um see if i can fix it so i just want to make sure it's, we can clearly hear better or uh i could try and plug in a microphone and see if it works i think it sounds a bit better but i don't know on your in uh in the physical office if you guys can hear it can you hear me better now? Can you hear me better? Yeah, that's a little bit better, I think. Okay. Um, all right. Sounds good. Oh, great. Yeah, that's all better. Now. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Um, so, so yeah, I, as as I was saying, um, Streamer um, is a streaming representation learning algorithm, and uh, we process streaming videos. And we what we try to do is we try to build hierarchical uh, um, events. Um, so we segment a video in, a, in a, the video, the streaming video, and we try to build hierarchical models or event models as I, I will discuss uh, later. But we also, in addition to that, we also try to learn representations of every model. So we have higher level uh, event models and we have lower level event models and we're trying to build uh, representations such that we can retrieve um, uh, these uh, events at di from different videos that are semantically similar. So, um, okay, let's get started. The outline of the uh, presentation is going to be, we're going to start with some goals and uh, the inspiration of this work. Um, the hierarchical segmentation, what, what I mean by that, and the representation learning part and all of that, we're just going to show some uh, visualizations. And then we'll talk about some biologically plausible learning constraints that I have got from uh, the Mentos papers. Now, some of them we uh, follow, others are still work in progress, and I'll talk about that. Um, then I will talk about some uh, cognitive uh, psychology uh, theories. Um, one that we've been very inspired by is event segmentation theory by uh, Jeffrey Zacks. I want to discuss that and uh, show how we build on top of it. Uh, after that, um, the implementation, of course, will uh, discuss a single layer architecture. This work has been published at uh, IJCV, where we have a very long video and we just have a single layer and we're trying to do segmentation, uh, spatial and temporal segmentation. Um, and after that, then we'll get to Streamer, where we extend this idea into a multi layer architecture and we have, uh, uh, we build a, a hierarchy of these event models. Um, there are some tricks that goes into training this model. Um, so we have to do some gradient normalization and stuff like that. We'll get to that, and then some results at the end. So this is the output of the model. Um, basically, we have multiple layers. We end up with multiple layers, and we want to process this in a streaming manner. So we have a possibly infinite uh, a video of infinite length. And as we're processing it, we're able to detect these boundaries and uh, build a hierarchy from that. Um, and um, the, the, the thing about building a hierarchy is that this is a hierarchy of events. Um, in, it's not a hierarchy of features. And I will talk about the difference between those two. Uh, mainly what we have in uh, deep learning nowadays is a hierarchy of um, just features, not events. So the way that people are pooling these um, and going into some, some sort of high order prediction or high order uh, processing is they're, they're pooling with 
some you know fixed uh, uh, kernel or something like that. Uh, this kind of pooling is different. We're pooling based on the the information in the data itself, and uh, we're we're ending up with some uh, meaningful segmentation. Right. So uh, yeah. So for example, here you would have like at the higher level you'd have the whole wash ball thing. And then uh, lower levels, you'd have smaller events that are, are higher, high, more details, but less context length. So uh, as we go up the hierarchy, we have uh, less details, but it covers more uh, of, the, of the input signal. And then we repeat. This is, this is it's the same process gets repeated uh, again and again. Um, Rami, I don't know if you want questions while we while we go, or if we want us yeah, to yeah, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, one quick question here. I'm not too familiar with the data set or the paradigm, but you're saying event segmentation, but then you have labels associated with it, like wash bowl, wash a cup, put it away. Is that is the goal to also do categorization so that next, if someone were to now wash another cup, a different cup? It would still end up with the same, right? The so same representation um, saying it's it's washing a cup, not a washing a bowl. Whatever. Right. So so this data set, uh, Epic Kitchens, it does not really have, um, uh, you know, a few unique labels. It has narrations. Um, what we end up with is a representation that we can. So we can look at the representation. Every every one of these segments has a representation, we call it the event model. And we can take this representation and find representations throughout the other videos that are doing semantically similar things, right? Okay. Uh, we're not really labeling these. I added those labels uh, just to show how the, to point out the event boundaries and how uh, at the end of the event boundaries actually has finished the add soap and all of that. But if you take one of those and, um, then, then apply uh, some distance measure for all of the other representations and all of the other videos, you'll be able to retrieve semantically similar ones. And that's actually the uh, other downstream tasks that we tried. Uh, okay. So, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. so um, retrieval is when you have a, a, we tried this experiment, we have a query uh, representation, and then we look through all the other videos and then find the uh, best match according to the distance measure between the representations that we've learned. Right, and we you can see here there are a lot of um, you know uh, things that are you know the visual features are not the same, but they're semantically similar. Um, like for example, the, the, even different kitchens, like here, it's a different stove. I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse cursor. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so uh, the it's a different stove here, but it's, it's the same kind of action. Uh, it's tilting the pan, um, the dishwasher here from different views cleaning uh, here, you know, it's a stove and a sink. So these, these kinds of semantically similar, but they're different visually and uh, from different videos. We limit this so that, uh, of course, if we set it such that it can get it from the same video, it would get, uh, you know, uh, events that are very close in time, but uh, we, we make it that, such that it only gets from different videos. So these are all from different videos. Okay, so um, just a little bit about the hierarchy of events. You know, I've already talked about that. Um, a hierarchy of events is, uh, when, when we talk about uh, hierarchy of events, it's different from hierarchy of features, where in features we've all seen, of course, something like uh, in, in the spatial dimension, maybe we're talking about images, we've looked at CNNs, and we know that there are, uh, the, these kernels, the CNN kernels at the high, higher levels, they're uh, representing uh, complex features. And then uh, at lower levels, they're not uh, very complex. It's just like lines or something like that. Uh, this is a hierarchy of features. Um, and it's still a hierarchy, but it's not really based on the content of the image. Um, this is more uh, where we segment based on the content of the image. You could have a very low level event that's very long, you know, for example, something like maybe reach bread, even if you reach very slowly, it's still the, the pooling that happens is going to happen um, over a very long, uh, you know, uh, context window or temporal uh, context at the low level. So 
uh, when we're pooling these things, we need to pool based on uh, what is going to be redundant for the higher level such that we could do some sort of higher order prediction, right? This whole reach spread, it's very predictable at the low level and it doesn't make sense to send it multiple times to the higher level to do uh, high order predictions. So when we pool, it's redundancy based. So um, the way we do that is through predictive learning um, and we'll get to that. But first, uh, some biologically plausible learning constraints. These are from uh, Nomenta papers. Uh, I've referenced them down here in my paper. Um, first one is continuous and online. Of course, we're not doing any batch. Excuse me. We're not doing any batch processing. Um, all of the processing is just a single stream of video, and we process that. Uh, we keep processing it, and the event boundaries, uh, we actually detect them uh, in a streaming manner. So we're building this hierarchy as we process the video. It's not uh, that we have to look at the whole video and then find the hierarchy. Um, it's, of course, also self-supervised. No annotated labels or anything like that. There is a general purpose algorithm. It's just predictive learning. We only have one loss function that is repeated at every level. So uh, one of the other constraints is uh, uh, local... Uh, like local uh, learning rules, or uh, I, I know that Nomenta has um, described that as local to the neuron. We don't have that here. We still do backprop, um, but it's also not a global loss function at the end of a CNN or a deep learning uh, architecture. Right here, we have multiple layers, and this uh, I, I still like to call it local. It's local to the to the layer itself. So every layer has its own predictive function and its own loss object objective that it's trying to minimize. And it doesn't really care about the other layers, what, what they're doing. So it's kind of local to the layer. Uh, so if you imagine CNN, these loss functions are uh, applied at the layer level instead of uh, a global function. So there's still back propagation, but you're not really using the chain rule necessarily to go deeper. Uh, into I, the I am using the chain rule, but it, it's only uh, at the at the uh, level at the so every layer has its own loss function and it doesn't really care. But this loss function is being back propagated into the the, the inputs. So there is some uh, uh, back prop still. Oh, so there's more than one layer of weights in each layer. Yes, and okay. these layers are identical, stacked on top of each other. Yeah, uh, and every layer has its own loss function. There is no global loss function. Um, higher order predictions, which I think is very necessary. Um, the All of the models, uh, um, many of the models, most of them in deep learning now, they don't really do higher order predictions. Um, they do, like, a, if you look at a transformer, for example, all these layers are stacked on top of each other. They are not really pooling uh, any of the context the right way and then predicting uh, uh, from these abstract representations. They're just mostly uh, the same context is just propagated upwards and uh, it's it's building representations that way. Um, I think it's very necessary to have pooled representations as we go up. Um, and then robustness, um, since we're not using SDRs, so my idea of robustness is different from Lamentas. Um, the robustness here is I, we're going to be looking at at the lower layers when we're doing predictions we're going to be getting some influence from higher levels. And um, uh, these higher levels, I believe they, um, because they're more robust and they're more stable since they don't have to deal too much with the low level noise, um, they actually um, make the, the predictions that the low level is also um, more robust because uh, we'll, get to how, we'll get to how to the, the architecture is built and uh, discuss this again. Okay, so you have feedback from higher levels to lower levels? Yes, there's okay. top-down uh, and bottom-up uh, inf inference. So during the okay. prediction, every layer is also looking at the higher levels and the lower levels and determining dynamically how much temporal context it needs to do the, to minimize its own prediction loss. So okay. That's great. these layers are acting uh, greedily, uh, greedily. So That sounds great. Uh, thank you. So um, 
before I move further, I just wanted to give credits to uh, Jeffrey Zaks, who came up with a theory in uh, cognitive psychology called uh, event segmentation theory. I just like to give him some credit. He's written some books. Um, they're very interesting books. I've read event cognition. It's very interesting if you're interested more about this kind of stuff from the psychology point of view. Um, but um, his interests are parsing continuous stream of behavior, excuse me, into meaningful events. So um, this is what event segmentation theory is about, how to parse a continuous stream into meaningful events and then how to um, how the, this event segmentation affects the uh, memory and cognition and uh, why is this necessary? And why is event segmentation just a side effect of perceptual processing? Why do we have to uh, segment as we process uh, and then treat these as coherent units in high order prediction or something like that? So event segmentation theory, I'm just gonna go through this uh, quickly. Um, so we have uh, sensory inputs and uh, there is perceptual processing of some sort. If we're thinking of deep learning, maybe a CNN of some sort. Um, and then we have an event model. So the idea of event segmentation theory is that every event has an event model. And this event model is responsible for explaining the inputs or the observations inside of this event. Now, as we uh, get an event, that get an input that's not from this event, uh, something outside of the event, the event model is now outdated and it cannot explain these observations. So we, we have to change the event model and get a new event model from something like long-term memory or event schematas um, and maybe save the old one uh, in the, again, in the event schemata. Uh, but the, the idea is that this new event model can now explain these new observations because they come from a different event, right? So um, let's have the whole figure here. Sensory inputs come in at maybe time t and t plus one. Uh, the perceptual processing processes both time t and t plus one. And then at time t, you predict what's going to happen at time t plus one. And then we have some error detection here. Now, the idea of an event model that um, explains the inputs is not new. This has been also in predictive coding and uh, many others, but there's a difference here. Um, there's, uh, we use the signal, the uh, error detection, in order to reset the event model and do shifting of some sort, and they call it shifting. Basically, just, just if the event model is unable to predict uh, what's coming next, then we need to change that event model. And this is where we detect the boundary. Um, so the, detecting the boundary, this is uh, basically segmentation. Um, and the event model can be saved and, or another one retrieved, or we can build a new event model to uh, try and learn this new sequence that we have not seen before. Okay, so uh, we've built a single layer architecture based on this. Um, and we have a very uh, long video. Uh, it's, it's just one video, the data set, the, this data set about the bird uh, in its nest. It's a very long uh, video, 10 days of continuous monitoring, more than 250 hours of uh, just monitoring of this uh, video, of yeah, this uh, bird. And uh, what we built here is, is something similar to uh, this here. Instead, the event model becomes an LSTM. So this is the event model. It's the hidden state inside of the LSTM. And uh, sensory inputs come in, IT and IT plus one. And then we use this IT, uh, the processed version of it, to predict the IT plus one. Similar uh, thing. And then the event model, of course, is in, in the LSTM. We added also some uh, attention. Um, basically, we, we figured if the event model has an actual representation of what's happening, then it must also know where in the image this is happening. So uh, we took this uh, hidden state, which is the event model, and we applied attention on the input image. And then we used that to filter the actual input image. So this basically gives us a heat map. The, uh, the processed input here is not just a feature vector, it's a, it's a feature grid. So in a CNN inception, we just uh, you know, uh, remove the last few layers and we, uh, we use an eight by eight grid. 
And this, and then this attention is basically attending to this eight by eight grid and uh, so on. The so goal this, of this. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to just try to cast this into kind of our temporal memory framework a little bit. See if I can. Um, so, you know, it's bit, you're, you're seeing a long stream of inputs, in this case, images or video, um, and it's constantly trying to predict what's happening next. Uh, in this, you know, using LSTM here, uh, but constantly making predictions. Uh, if there, if it cannot make good predictions, that's sort of a reset signal uh, in our temporal memory language, and that sort of set resets the and starts off a whole new sequence. In this case, another event, right? Um, but a uh, whole new recognized sequence. But in addition, you are also using a spatial attention. The attention here is not a temporal attention like it might be in. Uh, an LLM, but it's a spatial attention um, that allows you to say which portions of the visual input are responsible or most likely to for the particular sequences are, uh, that you're recognizing at this point in time. Is that at yes, least half, half, half way there? <laughs> no, yeah, that's, that's very accurate. Uh, the yeah. only thing that we didn't do uh, of what you said uh, is reset the event model. Uh, actually, in this in this particular version of the paper, we uh, we kept training it and assumed that the event model is going to just adapt to the new uh, sequence uh, okay. while training. Uh, LSTMs have the their own sort of notion of reset, right? There would um, so presumably that would happen sort of organically within the LSTM network. Right, so it can forget the cell state that that it has yeah. and, um, and and build a new one. That's, yeah, that's correct. So and then, um, what was the task again? Sorry, in in this particular uh, paper, uh, event segmentation, spatial and temporal event segmentation. Uh, this is an IGCV paper. Uh, encourage yeah. you to look nice. through it. So I'll show you some results, uh, and maybe that will make it clear. But sorry, just to clarify, so. Um... Yeah, so you said here you don't uh, reset the network. So in terms of the signal for the boundary uh, that you're kind of using as your sort of uh, output label, um, do you still kind of measure that uh, error? You just don't reset the network? Yes, so the okay. error tells us where the boundary is. Uh, so that's the, the output basically of the network, which just tells us where this boundary is. How do we segment? Uh, but I just continue to train this LSTM again. Right, um, thank you. Of course. Um, so uh, we, ha we have a few uh, events here that we're trying to detect. And um, we're also trying to find where the bird is in the nest using this attention. So uh, these are some results. This is a time lapse of the bird inside uh, the nest. <clears throat> and we're trying to, this is the attention basically. Um, it's looking at the nest and you can see that there's a lot of shadows going around and the attention is trying to stay on the bird. Even though the bird is not moving, shadows are moving, it still has learned some representation of the bird. The event, this event model has a representation of the bird such that it doesn't want to, uh, you know, it's kind of robust to uh, noise. And um, I think we can, so yeah, so the day to night, at night is not, it's not as good, but it's still, yeah, it's uh, still on the, bird at the middle of the nest. Now, um, OK. So um, I'll show also some other results where the, the birds actually, it's not time lapse. The birds actually coming into the nest and leaving. So I'm curious, what do you think is causing it to focus on the bird per se? Because the leaves are also very predictable. In fact, the leaves are more predictable than the bird. Um, what, what uh, so it? it's it's not the uh, predict. I think the it's building a representation of uh, uh, what helps it predict better, and uh, if it's if it's going to focus on what helps it predict better, then it needs to understand the the motion of the bird and the dynamics uh, there. If it's predictable, then it doesn't really need to, um, y uh, you know, it doesn't need to have so much attention on the bird to understand what's doing. Okay. This. So uh, these are some correct. I'm sorry, could I ask, ask one quick question. So 
when you showed showed the uh, the pattern of uh, shadows moving across, uh, how did it resolve that a, in a predictable way, such that it's still focused on the bird, but you had all this other animation uh, going on? So it must have learned uh, a good representation of the bird over time. And this representation, we set the learning rate very low. Um, uh, you know, it's like one e to negative eight. Um, and over time, it, it builds. So there's a lot of times, this is, um, there's a lot of times where the bird is just sitting there doing nothing and there's no noise. And from there, it learns a stable representation of the bird. When you start applying noise, it still wants to um, stay on the bird, uh, even if there's noise around. The noise, if the noise uh, to signal ratio is very high, I think it will focus more on the noise. Okay, so I, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, at, at first, I thought it was focusing on the bird because that was the thing that was kind of moving around, and you said you needed to predict it. But if something, how does it distinguish between? I mean, I, I why didn't it like shift attention to the the uh, shadows moving across as 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 being uh, more needing more to have to predict that? Yeah, I, I think it's related to how. Uh... The, the noise to um, um, uh, noise to signal ratio, right? So over a full day, the it it has more time to learn the representation of the bird as it's moving around. Uh, maybe a few hours of the day, there is these uh, shadows, and it has already learned a stable representation to be able to focus. So during these shadows, there's uh, still high prediction error from the shadows, but it's still the event model still has not adapted or tried to predict uh, the the shadows. So the attention is not going to change much during these times. OK, so it's, the notion is is uh, the time scale in which it adapts. So the bird is there more constantly. So therefore, it's gaining more, uh, pardon the expression in this case, attention. Of the, of the network <clears throat> and things that are transitory, it somehow uh, says that that doesn't fit in with what the model is, so we'll reject it. If if the bird moved off the nest after a while, would what would it do? It just still concentrate on, on the nest and anything transitory is rejected? Yes, yeah, so if the bird is not there for a while, for a long time, then it's going to try and figure out the, the next thing that uh, minimizes the prediction error. What, what's the second biggest problem for the network? And uh, we'll try to focus on that. OK, thank you. So um, some correct detections in terms of uh, temporal segmentation now. This is the prediction loss. And the bird is not in the nest. As the bird comes in, you can see the attention goes to the bird. Before that, I think the attention is spread or on something else, like the branch here. For, for example, I think this answers your question. If the um, attention is on the branch before the, the nest comes in, before the bird comes in, and then as the bird comes in, the attention starts to shift to the bird, even if it's stationary. And then as it moves uh, and goes out of the uh, nest, uh, we detect another peak. Uh, these are different examples of that. Um, So bird is, uh, goes in there and stays stationary, attention is on it, and then continues to move. And then we get another peak for exiting the nest or moving again. Um, and then there are some false detections. So uh, what I mean by false here is these, these events are not really in the data set, uh, but we've managed to uh, uh, detect them and uh, they counted as false detections because the, they're really not one of the uh, labels that we have. Uh, but there is some things happening here. So uh, it's some event. Since this is self-supervised, it's very hard to evaluate such models because not all events are in the data set. Okay, I'll just move on. Um, these are some results. I'm uh, not going to spend too much time on these unless uh, you guys want me to. Uh, but the, it's just some different ablations. And um, 
the, I think the main takeaway from here <clears throat> is that uh, the best model is able to recall 80% of all of the events. And um, this is uh, only at false positive uh, rate per minute of 0 0.02, which means it's getting one false alarm per 15 minutes, something like that. And um, recalling 80% of the events. Uh, more results, um, different kinds of results. Actually, this is for boundary detection rather than event detection. And uh, we show that we also outperform uh, the state of the art at this time, which uh, we outperform it by a lot, actually. These, uh, this uh, PADB, uh, DPC is a dense predictive coding architecture. It was basically uh, using pre-trained uh, features to, and uh, so it, it's not really uh, training on the data set. Uh, ours is training. And in this case, like the um, like the the main the the recent paper, um, do you only go through the data set once? Um, you view each frame a single time. Yes. Uh, do you have a yes, sense uh, for how uh, what why it's learning so quickly? Given that you're still using backpropagation and and like you mentioned, you use a really low uh, error. Uh, sorry, a very low uh, learning rate. So do you have yeah, a sense it's, why it's, it's able to learn not, just on a single uh, pass? It's actually not learning very quickly. Um, I can, let's see if I can move on to uh, find a paper quickly. There are some, uh... um, so there's a figure here that shows how, uh, so at the beginning of the training is not really learning as quickly. This is on for the uh, spatial segmentation. I'm showing the intersection of our union. Um, over time, this uh, basically it takes a few hours to get there to to learn. But once it has learned this representation of the bird, it then uh, stays uh, there. So, it I mean it takes some time depending, of course, on how uh, the learning rate is. But uh, we've experimented with the one uh, one times ten to negative eight, and it seems to be kind of stable in the way it learns, and it stays there at. Um, high uh, intersection of a union. So there is, of course, a, a, I think a, a burnout period or warm up, depending on the learning rate. And so in terms of kind of the advantage that this method has over the, the kind of ones you compare to or, or kind of what, what makes it perform better, because I guess uh, I can see with the, the follow-up work where you have multiple layers, you're taking in context from higher layers and lower layers. So that's something very different from uh, standard deep learning architectures. Um, and then if I understand correctly, so here it's, I guess, using the this kind of self-supervised paradigm, and then I guess otherwise the focus on the, um, yeah, I guess using the prediction error for the event detection. Do you think that's why that there's, um, yeah, it, it doesn't need that much time to learn or? So um, it, I guess by comparison, it, it, it still seems quite quick. Right, so uh, these methods, so, uh... PADPC, this is a method that uses pre-trained features and it does not actually uh, adapt to the data set. Uh, all of these are actually, so uh, they're not really- Oh, so they're the kind of zero shot evaluated. Right, right. Um, I see. And yeah, the idea of that paper was that, you know, we could just use these pre-trained features and, uh, and, and do that. Uh, we're saying, no, we can just start from scratch and we could learn as we go and adapt to any data set. Okay, thanks. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, spatial segmentation. Um, but you can think of probability sum as intersection of a union. We just had to use uh, this metric uh, because of the the way the ground truth is provided, or uh, the way we've annotated the ground truth is it's a boundary, it's a bounding box rather than a mask, and what we get is a is an attention map. So we add up the probability inside of the uh, the ground truth bounding box, and the higher it is, the better. We've also done intersection of a union. We, uh, both of those have different uh, pros and cons here. But uh, what you can see is that we, what we want is high um, high peaks at close to one uh, uh, probability sum. So um, and what we're getting with the other methods, the, depending, of course, on whether the bird is moving or stationary, optical flow is going to perform very badly if the bird is uh, stationary. You can see a very high peak at zero. Background subtraction, um, all these methods are not really going to. Uh, so, Dino, excuse me. 
Dino is a, a self supervision, self supervised method for images, and they they can find uh, very good attention maps, but still didn't work on our method. We even tried to pre train it, and uh, uh, these methods don't really um, work, even if it, even if we try to pre train it on our uh, uh, data set, it still didn't work uh, because it needs a very diverse uh, you know, uh, images or inputs. So, um, you know, what happened here is that we get um, like a 0 0.4 probability sum and two high peaks here for moving and stationary. Um, ours is the only one that's able to predict uh, for moving and stationary uh, high peaks at close to one and different day, night shadows and all of that. We've tried it on... Uh, a pretty big difference there. Right, yes, uh, very, very big, yes. Right. Uh, we also tried it on uh, some other domains. Uh, this, the, so the prediction error uh, here, we our errors are detected at the peaks, and uh, the ground truth is the red one, the red uh, cross. And we can see that the the boundaries are close to the ground truth boundaries in most of the videos, and uh, the attention is up here. And uh, mostly, even if their their camera is moving, uh, most of the time it still keeps the attention on the you know, there's, there's a lot of noise, but uh, it still works without too much pre-training. So uh, we can come back to this later. So we can, I'm gonna start uh, discussing streamer. So if, if, let's start from scratch. Um, so let's say we have a very simple predictor model, uh, predi predi uh, uh, you know, a prediction uh, learning model. We have uh, an input at time t and an input at time t plus one, and we, we want to predict the input at time t plus one, right? So we predict x t hat at time t plus one. But if we have multiple inputs as a sequence, we want to come up with a context for that, uh, like a summary of some sort. So we take it and put it through an encoder. It gives us a z representation. Uh, we could use a transformer or some sort of a recurrent neural network, uh, LSTM or uh, whatever, that summarizes this input and gives us Z. If you want, to, if we want to use the transformer, we could do something like this: uh, just add positional encoding and just take this whole set as X and just uh, pass it through the network. It gives you Z, gives you a Z. Now, this is of course, it's not a summary until it's trained through uh, uh, to do a uh, prediction. And now let's imagine that we have this uh, temporal encoding module operating at different levels, right? Uh, here, this image shows it as um, they're operating at the same time scale, but they're actually not. Higher levels are operating at a different time scale than lower levels. So if each one of them has its own time scale. And we'll get to that, but this was just easier to uh, uh, visualize. So uh, the reason we're doing that is because we're going to take these representations, these multi-level representations, uh, whatever the most recent representations is at, at all of the levels, and they're going to go into a predictor at every level. So let's go to a predictor, uh, and then this predictor is going to take not only the Z at its own level, but also the Z at the higher and lower levels. So it'd be something like this. So the, these Zs, we call them as set Z, and that uh, this transformer is going to take all of them and then try to predict uh, x hat t plus 1 at this level. Now we have other transformers that are doing the same thing at uh, uh, each other, at the other levels. It's funny, this this reminds me a lot of our of a neural model. Uh, well, um, which models? The, the previous diagram where you had the three Cs coming in. Uh, right, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, this is like a bottom-up input, a lateral input for, to distal dendrites, and a top-down input, which could be to apical dendrites. I see. Um, yeah, so um, actually, when I show the figure, I think uh, the, um, the full architecture, it will show this as a communication module. It's getting, it's getting um, bottom-up, top-down, and... Uh, current uh, uh, input from the uh, same level. 
Yeah. Um, but then the the other side of this is that after the prediction, we have the loss function. And this loss function is what trains the whole model. Uh, now we have one at every level, of course. But uh, so this is at level L, as you can see here. And it's just doing x hat with x. And, and x is the full vector of inputs? Uh, yes, x, uh, x, yes, without the hat, this is the full vector, then this is the prediction. So this is the input at this level, which is, um, this input is z of the, uh, of the layer below it, because I'm going to show how uh, basically this input is the summarized representation of the event at the lower level. Um, I'll show a very nice uh, information flow diagram that will make this clear. So what this also allows us to do is we can look at this distance between x hat and x, and we can threshold it. We can say, OK, so if this event model cannot really predict if the prediction error is high, then we can re reset the event. And when we reset the event, we send the representation z that we have, send it upwards to the higher level for high order prediction, and we re just reset it and we start over learning a new sequence. So. This um, loss is being backpropagated into the transformer and the predictor. It's training them. And it's also training uh, the other transformers at all of the other layers. So as you can see here, uh, uh, phi is being optimized. Phi is the transformer parameters, and C is the uh, predictor parameters. We're optimizing all of the layers. So. Every predictor is optimizing not only its uh, transformer, but also the transformer at other layers. Um, so the transformer at every layer, its job is to provide a representation that is helpful for its own prediction, but also for other layers' prediction. Uh, they're all acting greedily and trying to uh, optimize their own prediction loss. Yeah, in terms of kind of yeah, how the backpropagation is working, then is it? Would you say is it right to kind of think of each layer? When it's doing, uh, when it's updating its weights with backpropagation, you can kind of think of it as being at the top of its own network, where its input includes kind of top-down inputs. Um, for for the per for like from the point of view of that layer, um, and then you do those asynchronously, uh, those updates or. Um, yeah. So every layer doesn't really know uh, what the other layers are doing. So. Every layer is trying to, so uh, in backprop, uh, I actually, to, to get this to work, I actually have to just accumulate the gradients. And then after a while, I just uh, step through the gradients. I, I don't know if this answers your question, but uh, I'm not updating the gradients at every time step because I have to wait for the right. higher level okay. of the center. And you're not unrolling anything through time. Um, no. so. Um, not re so the, the only unrolling through time is the temporal encoding function it's not really unrolling but like it's, it's using a transformer but you could use an lstm and the the representation that we get out of it if you're using an lstm representation that we're get getting out of it uh that is being the one that's optimized so it has to unroll through only the event uh with respect to that layer so um at at the lowest layer, if we have, if we're doing temporal encoding on maybe A B C, uh, this is a sequence. Then this is where the unrolling is happening. If you're using transformer, then it's not really unrolling through time, but it's equivalent. Yeah, but if you're using a temporal, uh, uh, sorry, if you're using a transformer, you have a fixed uh, time period that you're looking at. You don't have a, a dynamic time period like you might with uh, with our HDM memory or with an LSTM. So the the, uh, the transformer is training the attention, but you could give it a sequence of any length. So um, during during processing, uh, just like a, an LSTM or a recurrent neural network, you could just give it a, a, a five inputs, two inputs, three inputs, and uh, it will still do, apply the same attention across uh, these inputs and give you some result. Um, but the, but the, at any point in time, it can only look back a fixed 
uh, point in time to to make the prediction, right? Uh -huh. it, it, is the it, transformer seeing the full history of the video sequence, or just just a fixed last n? Yeah, frames? so that depends on the event demarcation. That depends on when we stopped, uh, when we reset the event. Um, so it's not able to see. Um, let me actually the the next the next uh, animation is going to make it clear. So we have uh, something oh, like this. I, where... I see. Uh, you keep growing the context window until you see an event demarcation. Right. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, we only when we see the event demarcation, the context is just being sent up, um, and we're doing higher order predictions at that. Um, and you can see the higher levels are getting sparser inputs than the lower levels, um, but that's just how it is. So the higher levels, uh, are they actually processing anything while yeah. you're so the, in, in a window that's um, what, while you're within some lower level event? Or does it only process when there's an event? So um, it, it waits until uh, the lower level sends it an input. So as soon as it gets an input, it processes that and it predicts. And uh, it just waits until it gets a new input to make the comparison of what it predicted with what has been sent. And depending on that comparison, it's either going to extend its event or send what it has already upwards for higher order prediction, even higher. Okay, so it's not like the brain where every all the layers are constantly working asynchronously and continuously. <laughs> the higher levels will process at specific points in time that's dictated by when events are detected at the lower levels. Yeah, I, I think if your question is, are they always predicting at every time step, all of the layers? Uh, no, so they only, uh, in this architecture, they're only predicting once they get an input uh, or like they predict after they get an input, they predict and then they just wait for another input to come in. Uh, okay. Because they don't but need I guess to if actually... you If you left it running, just forever, like it, it's only kind of at the start of uh, when you initialize the network, I guess, that it, the top layers are kind of totally naive, right? Um, yeah, uh, so... Uh, so if you kind of just kept running it, then even the highest layers would have some sort of representation. Right, right, of course, yes. So the, the highest layer is actually doing exactly the same thing as the lowest layer, predicting and correcting its representation. And so when it gets an input, the only thing is that this input is over a longer context and lower details, right? So, um, you know, I, I say I'm, I'm maybe that, uh, yeah, an example of that would be maybe uh, lower level events would, uh, or like higher level events would maybe me, me going from my lab to home or something like that. And then what happens after I go from lab to home, maybe I go to the gym. So these are higher level events. And they're, they're sparser events, right? Because they have and happen over longer temporal context. Low level events would be, uh, for me, from going from here to uh, home, I would have to get in my car. That's one event. I would have to do this and do that. The higher levels don't really see these events. Uh, they just see the, the bigger picture, but it's lower details. Um, so low levels are much higher detail, uh, but shorter context and so on. But to, in order to predict, we provide all of the layers with the most recent representation of the, uh, of the event model at every layer so that they can predict accurately. So in, in some sense, the higher layers uh, are idle unless they're called upon to, to make sense of what the lower la levels cannot uh, handle, uh, not predict anymore. So the lower levels are always, they always have, when they're predicting, they always have the representation from the higher level, what so far, what, what we have. But they're all, they're either, they could be outdated, uh, could be like, um, maybe the next figure will make it uh, clearer. So this is the same thing as uh, what I had before, but the higher, so this is an info, like a flow chart, right? Maybe I, I'll go through this and then uh, maybe that would answer your question. So we have a uh, layer L, layer L plus one and layer L minus one. And we get a new input at layer L, right? Uh, at some time scale. This new input is compared to the predicted um, input from the, previous, uh, from the previous time step. 
And this prediction just tells us whether this is a new event or uh, if it's a continue to add it to the, to the current event and we don't need to send anything. If it's a new event, then this is where we send the representation that we currently have of that event, send it up, and then we reset the uh, set of inputs again. So we, we add this new input to a new set, and then we use it for uh, encoding and doing the prediction and all of that. If it's not a new event, we just add it to this set of inputs, and we continue to do prediction. Right. And, and so, the reset, just to be clear, is like a reset of the transformer's context. Correct. Yes. Okay. We don't care anymore about what we uh, had before because we've already sent it to the higher level. And that higher level is actually going to provide it again as a context in our prediction. It's just that we, we don't care about it now because it's already at the higher level. If we need it, we'll, we'll be able to get context from it through this um, hierarchical prediction because it, we can get this uh, Z again. Uh, if we need it, right, from the higher level. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Um, yeah, that's helpful, but a um, little confused about that last point you just mentioned. So the feedback from the higher level is coming in through that black arrow, right, that thick arrow. But yes. Why is that bidirectional? Is that that's also being sent to the next level? So, yes, so at prediction, for any so this prediction only happens of course when we get an input from here right yeah. but what happens is at prediction we are going to get the most recent representations from higher level and lower level and that's going to help us predict more accurately i see okay so once we mm -hmm. send this z upwards we still have access to it through the pre the predictor right and uh, did you guys to... explore oh sorry go ahead, yeah. sorry. no no go ahead I was just going to ask, did you guys explore uh, passing the difference in the like the prediction error itself? Um, because I guess that would be kind of the classic predictive coding uh, approach. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, we, ha we have not done that. Uh, yeah, the predictive coding, they, they just pass the difference and uh, like PredNet. Uh, yeah. Um, no, we, we, we passed the whole representation that we, the, the summary of the event model. Uh, uh, we have yeah, not okay. really experimented the predictive coding that way. Thanks. I think one one confusion maybe I had. I think you, you know, it, the layer L is getting uh, the Z at the current time step from the previous level, so it's uh, Z L minus one T, but it also gets the previous prediction Z L minus one T minus one. Right, it's getting both of those simultaneous. Uh, it it could just hold on to the ZL for one more time step. It doesn't necessarily need to have another pathway coming in. I'm not sure I uh, I, I, I was, uh, I understood that. So you're saying that it's getting this from here and it's getting it from here? Is that what you're saying? That's right. Yeah, but that, that last second one to the next time step will be the previous one, right? It's just time shifted yes, by one. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's so, not the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then each block would just keep track of the last, the previous one as well. It doesn't necessarily need to be sent twice. Um, each block can keep track of the. Um, I'm not sure. Not it's, sure. A, it's an important point, but um, yeah, you, you can ignore it. It's just a small thing. Okay. And just to maybe mention Subutai, um, we're about an hour. I don't know if uh, we all continue, but then I don't know if you uh, had something else or. Uh, so I think almost done here. I just wanted to share maybe. So this is the full overview. Uh, and that's, uh, we have some, um, so this this the same communication uh, cross layer thing between the layers and uh, for, for implementation, we have since we're doing it on frames, we have we just add CNN encoder and CNN decoder at the lowest layer. Um, so the prediction error of the lowest layer is going to be over the pixels, and that's the only implementation detail. Um, and then these are just hacks to how to train this. I was just going to go over the Jacobian and all of that stuff. Uh, if you have time, I can go through this stuff, um, and then some results at the end. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And 
Well, one thing I was curious about, so I, I seem to remember you tried both transformers and feed forward networks for the uh, kind of integration functions. Um, did you uh, have a chance to try using an LSTM and see how that compares? Because yeah, I guess that would be quite a bit more efficient. You just have that single representation. Yeah, um, in the paper we've actually tried. Oh. Or maybe I missed it, yeah. Uh, no, I, I didn't include that in here. Um, in the paper we have, uh, we do have ablations uh, cross using, uh, for the F function we have GRU and LSTM. It's, it turns out that the uh, transformer is a little better uh, than both of them, but it's not by that, by that much. Uh, mm -hmm. when we use a transformer. Uh, but LSTM and GRU still work, and they give us good results. Which was um, faster in, in, I guess, probably transformer if you're using GPUs? Um, that I have not really, uh, yeah, considered the, the speed of these. But the thing is, uh, these events are not really long uh, series because every layer has, just gets a few inputs and uh, there's an event boundary after that. So it's not really doing this over a huge context. This is the I idea see. of the hierarchy. So, and this is probably also why we don't have a big performance difference between LSTM and GRUs because the performance difference is going to be when you have a very long context, transformers are doing this quadratic thing and LSTMs, they cannot really do a very long context. They get, uh, they have their own problems. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and just to better understand, I guess, the kind of how continual learning fits in with this, because, um, yeah, so uh, like, do you keep, uh, for example, do you, does the network keep learning when it sees the uh, kind of test data set in a way? Like, does it keep updating the architecture or um, did you have a chance to kind of see how it, it handles catastrophic forgetting if you, if you move to a different, uh, like a totally different data set or? Um no, that, that we have not done catastrophic forgetting. Uh, but I just want to point out something. When we train this, we don't really have to, uh, like my uh, vision of this is that it should continually be training uh, during inference or training or whatever, because it's self-supervised and it should always be updating and learning its, uh, you know, optimizing its weights um, in a streaming manner. But of course, for the paper, we had to freeze uh, after the training set and just use whatever we have there to evaluate those boundaries and representations. But we yeah. have not, so I think the catastrophic forgetting is a very important thing. I don't know if uh, this uh, solves it. I think that using higher level context helps with the catastrophic forgetting because let's, let's assume that we have a, a lower layer and it's changing, it's learning some things and then the distribution is changing. Uh, it still has access to those higher level things that have not changed uh, in this low level distribution shift. So it still is uh, a bit more robust. So um, saying that we've sent the representation up, we still not use, we're still not changing that representation, even though the lower level stuff is changing. So I think that helps. Uh, but also I think that uh, we may need um, event models. We, we need some... Uh, models that are not touched during training. Um, so um, the, even though, uh, so here we're still using just a single uh, model and that model is changing even though we're sending it up, but it still is changing. Uh, but we don't have like a library of models where some of them are trained, others uh, are fixed even over longer periods of time, like long-term memory. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, the idea of continuously learning, like you're saying, is is makes a lot of sense, and obviously that's what happens in humans <laughs> as well. And one, but you're right. I I do think I mean the higher level might help, but I think there's still going to be significant catastrophic forgetting here, because if you imagine you're in your house in your kitchen for a few days, but then you go on vacation for a few weeks, and you're in a different set of thing. When you come back to the house, you're going to forget about everything in the house, right? Um, and so you will need something to mitigate that. And you know, we think it's uh, techniques like sparsity and contextual updating and things will help. You don't, you know, it's it, in the brain. It's not like you have a hundred completely independent models sitting around. It's just one model that a one network that you have to update. So you need strategies for updating the that one network without forgetting the old stuff. 
that's yeah uh, that's actually a work in progress i'm actually working on that right now uh, i think of these um, contexts higher level contexts as kind of like short term memory where but at every level we still need a set of models where only a few of them are being trained uh, and others are not and that also gives us the um, possibility of doing the multiple uh, like every because if we if we use all of these models that uh, like uh, let's say we have a hundred models, but we only train or use some of them that are uh, uh, good for these for for the current event. Then we could also generate from them maybe twenty different possibilities or hundred different possibilities or whatever. So uh, the event models, if we have a set of them, we could also generate multiple possibilities. I think this is uh, this would be a good idea to do that. Yeah, I don't do know you if you've seen our catastrophic forgetting paper. Um, you know, perhaps it'll give you some ideas, but. Um, you know, we do things, uh, you know, you mentioned you don't have SDRs. I don't know if you've thought about incorporating sparsity uh, in, in some shape or form in there, but that that might help with some things. Yeah, yeah I've, I've been considering it. Uh, the, yeah, the work that I'm doing uh, right now is, uh, is, go, is, you know, very inspired, it's more, much more inspired by uh, Nomenta than this. Uh, okay, cool. Do you, do you have a heuristic for setting the learning rate as a function of the level in the hierarchy? Uh, presumably, there's different time scales involved, so theoretically, there should be some knock-on effect on the learning rate. Right. Very good question. Uh, I I just didn't have time to go through it, but I could go through it. Uh, there is actually multiple uh, uh, things that are that affect the uh, the gradients, and uh, time scale is one of them. So because at higher levels, we have uh, sparser inputs, which means that we maybe like we have one update for a series of like maybe, I don't know, four updates at the lower level. So when we want to normalize these gradients, we uh, multiply the higher level by the number of inputs at the lowest level. So every layer is also like their gradients are multiplied by the number of layers, but the number of inputs that happened at the lower level in real time, because every video is different. So this is, uh, it's getting these numbers in, as, as a streaming. That's I, one of them. If I understood what you were saying earlier, the gradients flow, like the prediction error from the lowest level will flow gradients back through all levels? Correct, yes. And so each level is sort of being trained on multiple objectives, prediction error from each of the levels ultimately, although at different temporal rates were there sort of any stability issues that came out of that? Did you have to sort of operate with a specific set of learning rates to make it stable? Um, no, actually, uh, it, the so there are there are multiple things that I did. Uh, so reach of influence is one of them, uh, basically, because the the gradients are uh, flowing back from here to a higher level and lower level, and this one, uh, of course. The, the whole normalization thing, uh, all of these make a difference in stability. Um, but uh, we also uh, modify the, we, we multiply these gradients by some factor uh, based on alpha. And uh, that reduces the effect, the, the, the reach of influence. And if there's more layers up here, maybe uh, we'll even send less and less uh, effect from this layer. But this is this was just for, uh, just to, to, to see what the effect of that is. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so, so uh, and then there's feedback, which is because we're getting multiple inputs from uh, different losses on the same temporal encoding. So we just have to divide by the, oh, by the number of layers. That's just, all of these are just gradient tricks uh, to make it stable. But one thing that we have to remember is even though we're sending uh, this loss, to here, so so this temporal encoding is trying to also make this uh, the loss at the higher level happy. Uh, it's also trying to predict its own uh, loss, and perhaps based on alpha, it will be with more weight. So it's it, it, it's not like it will collapse, right? Because it's still trying to do its own thing uh, at at its own layer. So that prevents it from collapsing, if that's what you're asking. Great, thanks. It's great, thank you. I really like your diagrams and the way you step through it uh, by step.